Welcome to Riding on Stone Provincial Park. Our journey today is as much about the landscape as it is about connecting with the spiritual world. One of the things that I like visitors to recognize is that this is a very significant place for the Blackfoot people. And I'm a Blackfoot person, and a lot of the things that I share with them are from the Blackfoot culture. There is evidence that First Nations people inhabited this Milk River Valley as long ago as 9,000 years. Carving pictures into these relatively soft sandstone cliffs was a way warriors and others could record significant events in their lives. Today, Dr. Jim Kaiser, one of the world's leading authorities when it comes to deciphering and understanding rock art, joins Elma to explain to her and us about the messages etched into these rocks. Right, Jim, so what do we have here? Well, these are, these are Indian petroglyphs. They're carvings made by the Indians. Sometimes some of these carvings are made by the Blackfeet and the Bloods, the local Indians. Some are made long enough ago that we don't know who made them. Others are made by Indians who visited this area. Okay. But lots of these carvings are apparently made by the Blackfeet. For good luck? In, in a sense, yes. Some of these carvings have to do with the acquisition of spirit helpers. Okay. So then that, that brings you not only good luck, but success in your life. It's not just a matter of luck. And others of these carvings show warriors and essentially they're saying this is who I am. I'm an important man here and I have done these important deeds and so the carvings are made to commemorate these important deeds. Why don't we go along the cliff and see some more of this stuff? Perhaps there is no stronger illustration of recording an important deed than this 300 year old carving of a warrior in battle. What you see here is biographic art where this guy here is doing something to this guy. And here's our guy with the, what we call an hourglass body here. And here's his legs and his head's a little round dot. And here's his big spear with a spear point on it here. And it's feathered, okay, feathered lance. And he's actually touching or killing his enemy here who also has a shield and who has this weapon here, you see, with the spike sticking out of it. So this guy is fighting this this guy, he's got a big spike, an elk antler spike in a, in a stick, and this guy has this big long spear, and he is counting coup on this fellow. So basically here, this man drew this to communicate with you across 300 years. Of the more unusual markings are these bullet holes. Well, at first glance, one might think this is the work of a vandal, Dr. Kaiser has another theory that Indian people all across North America shot at, either with arrows or guns, these same sorts of things. Now, who particularly did what bullet hole, you can't tell, but they did it for good luck, essentially. It was safe passage. Some of it has to do with sympathetic magic, so if I shoot this animal, I'll shoot an animal. A lot of that is really just a good luck thing. In passing, you make an offering to the spirits who control this place. Now, one of those offerings is an arrow or a bullet. The bullet holes may hold meaning, but there are plenty of other markings which are nothing more than graffiti. Archaeologist Jack Brink from the Royal Alberta Museum is working on a plan. What we've been doing in more recent years is there have been a lot of advances in, in the archaeology of rock art from a perspective of how do we, how do we manage and deal with this kind of um, record of the past. And there are a few people in the world now, not very many, but a couple who specialize in trying to take out or remove or mask these names, the dates, the slogans that people have left over the years. And Parks has now identified some funding, and just this year, we're going to be bringing in an expert to start to what we call remediate the rock art mm -hmm. vandalism. And that, we don't say remove, because in many cases, you don't actually remove it. It's a masking up. We might, for example, patch sand into some of these, uh, the names and initials, and then paint or color that sand. So what you're really doing is you're hiding it from the eye of the, of the viewer. As much as the graffiti is an issue, it's the work of wind, water, and time that may ultimately cause all this art to fade. It will be up to First Nation advisors to determine if technology should be used to intervene with that natural process. But it's also one of my favorite ones because when you're seeing those hills, they're very significant to us. What will continue, though, are the stories and the special culture these images represent. That kind of connection that people have from the Blackfoot communities to the drawings. And so I love taking them out here and sharing that with other people so when they leave writing on stone, 
they see a different side of us than, the, than what they would normally see maybe in the cities or in other places that they don't see this side of our culture very often.